So welcome everybody. I'm very happy to have you. And we have today a very interesting webinar. We are uh, going to talk about how to bring or how to uh, include or how to use the sustainable and responsible investing, but especially to respond to the demand to institutional investors. You know? So how can you bring capital at scale and what does it matter? We also have Marco from The Hague. So I think a lot of friends I can, <laughs> I can see and pass them from Warsaw. So very lots of people with hopefully very lively and interesting questions. So as you, if you, since you've been following these webinars, we have our spectrum of financial returns and impact. And we have been doing different webinars with different actors and focuses on different parts of this social finance spectrum, if you want. If you want today, we are going to have a special focus on responsible and sustainable investment. We will touch maybe a little bit of the magic with SDGs, but the idea is that we are going to be in this sector where uh, we are going to address in a certain way how we married the market returns with impact and ESG integration, if, if you want, uh, in this case. So when we talk about sustainable finance, and I probably don't need to repeat myself since many of you have been here already with me, but we're really talking about a set of investment strategies that incorporate environmental, social, and governance considerations into the investment decisions. And some of those strategies that are very common, these are non exhaustive, but the most typical ones, I, I kind of put them in, in three buckets, but you can have them all separate, is exclusionary screening, so or norm based screen, screening where you decide to eliminate certain companies or certain industries uh, due to uh, objectable or uh, products or servers or even norms or violations. You know? And I think this was very popular, especially on the first wave of responsible investment. And it can be tracked even to the 1990s with the apartheid in, in South Africa. You know? So there is, uh, and I see a typo there on exclusionary that I should fix. I, I'm a little OCD sometimes, sorry. So the second part is ESG integration and best in class. So to counteract a little bit this exclusionary side, I said, okay, let's go into the positive side of the story and really invest and include ESG factors analysis for companies that are actually good at it, you know? And sometimes we focus and we have our intentionality on very specific things. We can do all oceans or conservation or climate change or clean energy. Um, so uh, we are trying to integrate this criteria and this intention in a, in a positive screening way. And something that is becoming very, uh, I would say very popular, but it's not easy to, to do is asset managers becoming much more active and engaging good companies in order to transform their business models and, and in a certain way to accompany the process of the transformation and sometimes through proxy voting, if you want, even voting against uh, certain board members or certain decisions to try to avoid negative impact. So these are some of the strategies uh, that you can see in, in, in the literature, or you can see in practice, that we are going to discuss with GERD today, and we're going to see how that applies very specifically in this case. But before we start, and you probably know me a little bit by now, I want to poll and get a little question from you. So I'm opening up now a poll that is actually asking you if you would be interested for your pension fund to actually use a sustainable uh, or responsible strategy with your money. So the answers are very simple. Yes, no, or you don't have an opinion yet. Maybe you're waiting to the end of this webinar <laughs> to make a decision. Let's end the poll and see our results. So we actually... Uh, I will share the results. We have 80% of the people in this webinar. Maybe there's a little bit of a selection bias here. We have people that care about these things usually, but actually think that, yes, you do want uh, your pension fund uh, to uh, in use a, a sustainable strategy. 
and we have a 15% that still not sure, but at very just, I think one person is very small percent say, no, I don't, I don't want, this is not for my pension fund. Let me launch another poll. Let's get a little bit more specific. What if it sacrifices returns? So what if in order to have a sustainable strategy, you will get less return for your pension. And this is obviously what you need to make a living after you retire. Uh, what do you think? Would you still want that strategy? How much returns are sacrificed? I understand, Marco, we're trying to simplify it, but at least some returns that will dent your pocket and a little bit your lifestyle, you know? But let me show the results. And now it changed from that 83. It, it, so we still have 55% of our audience saying yes, 7% uh, not having an opinion and 40% saying no. So now we have, I would say even half, uh, almost half that really are in doubt of going into uh, sustainable strategies or sustainable finance. So before we start and then introduce you properly to, to Gert, uh, let me remind you, now we're going to pass from the chat rather than writing on the chat to writing directly in the, oh, sorry, in the Q&A. Uh, so if you look at the Q&A below, you have a little icon there. Uh, so if you have questions for the speaker, uh, please ask questions there. There is also a little sign that you can click a like. So if you see a question from somebody else, uh, you can actually like it and that question will pop up and I will be able to see it. Here we also have Patrick Reichardt. You're gonna see his, his picture on the side. Uh, he's a research fellow at the LEA Center for Social Innovation. He has a PhD in social finance and he's supporting us also with the Q&A and he will be answering some of the quick questions and some other questions I will bring uh, to our speaker during the, the conversation. So now without more further ado and probably that the, the presentation, the slide with the presentation pop up wrongly before, but let me introduce you to Gerd uh, Dijkstra, Senior Manager Director at APG Asset Manager. Uh, he's responsible for the global networks and peers and for investing in the Netherlands. He formerly was a chief of strategy and communication and member of the board at APG Asset Manager from 2010 to 2017. So we're very lucky to have him here. He has an ample experience. He actually joined ABP in the year 2000 and he had very many different positions uh, there uh, and asset management since 2008. And he's been a manager business development, legal and tax and program manager. And he has worked in the implementation of a new multi-client fund structure. So really most of his experience lies in the financial sector and the food sector. And before joining APG asset manager, he, was, he made a career in management consulting, and he spe specialized in strategic mar marketing at corporate strategy and finance. So he really has a, a many different angles to look at the topics we're gonna talk today. And as you know, he also has given frequent lectures and seminars and roundtables in universities. So I always like to, to bring people that, that are also teachers at heart, you know, that, that have this, this angle too. So, uh, thank you, Gert, for being here. It's an it's a honor and pleasure to have you. And just to jumpstart the discussion uh, on, on sustainable and responsible investing, what is APG Asset Management and what is your role and why sustainable investing matters? Welcome. Yes. Uh, Vanina, thank you very much. Uh, all good morning or even good afternoon or good night, I guess, from a clouded Netherlands. Amsterdam is not really sunny at this moment in time. Having said that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of uh, my experiences and our uh, beliefs with you. Um, I think it's, it's always good to uh, describe the position from which I talk. So I would love to, to briefly uh, touch upon APG asset management uh, as an asset manager for Dutch pension funds. Um, 
maybe the, the yes, this one. So, in a nutshell, APA asset management is a a asset manager owned by two large pension funds, and we are specialized in managing the assets of four Dutch pension funds. Currently, we have, and that's a bit volatile, as you probably understand, we have around 540 billion euros assets on our management, of which we around 75% manage internally. We have a staff of around 900 people working in the Netherlands, working from our New York office, Hong Kong office. And a uh, half year ago, we opened a small foothold in Beijing. Um, we work for four Dutch pension funds, which have uh, in total 4.5 million participants. So basically, we provide the pensions for one out of five families in the Netherlands. Um, if you look at our uh, returns in the past, I think it's, uh, and I will come back to that, but I think it's good to mentioned that it's somewhere between six and 7% average absolute return in the past 20 years and a 0.7% uh, net added value. Um, I think if you would characterize APG asset management, we are pretty uh, entrepreneurial, innovative, and we're seeking for, uh, for uh, partnerships. Having said that, I think that that's in the core of what APGS management is. So our two shareholders, that's good to mention, are two large pension funds, uh, which, by the, say, by the way, are also our two largest clients. Having said that, I think you already, uh, Vanina, mentioned uh, my role as senior managing director, mm -hmm. focusing basically on three responsibilities. The first one being investing in the Netherlands. You might... Um, guess that our large clients want to be very visible in the Netherlands, be part of society. And that I they see, think uh, investing in the Netherlands is important. The second uh, uh, area of responsibility includes the, to maintain and enhance relationships with their peers. So pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds and endowment funds around the globe. Uh, to jointly invest, to jointly set standards, including standards on uh, sustainable and responsible investing. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the second one. And the third one is a group of projects which might include tax, culture, all kinds of different subjects, uh, which makes it pretty nice working for APG asset management, for me at least. So that, that's an, uh, as an introduction. What makes a pension fund different? No, and what what is the added value? Uh, well, I love to show this uh, this uh, slide because here you see that from each uh, 100 euro paid out today to a pensioner, being a fireman, a teacher, or a building constructor, the employee he or herself contributed during those 30 or 40 years seven euro on average. Mm his or her employer contributed 18 euro. And to make it 100 euro, we have to work for the uh, 75 euro based on investment income. So that's the added value of APG asset management for the clients uh, we have in the, the, the Dutch pension uh, sector. So I think the question that Marco had about, uh, you know, how much return we forego, we can see that even a small giving up return can have a big impact on those 75 percent you know of every uh, hundred hundred euro you no know? so if you're all very worried about our pension funds and what kind of returns we can expect and and we don't do care about because you've seen half of our people drop from that or not half but like this one third dropped mm -hmm. uh, from this willingness if they have to lose uh, returns you no know? Uh, if we care about sustainable investment, do we need to forego returns? What do you see is happening in price in practice, and how do you manage these four large pension funds that you mentioned? Yep. Well, <laughs> absolutely key question is uh, to is there a tension between returns and sustainable and responsible investing? And since uh, a decade and a half, I think our answer on that one uh, tends to be increasingly, no, there's not attention. And uh, in the early 
uh, years of this century, I think around 2004, 2005, we saw the first academic research where at least the assumption was, and the assumption was proved that there need not be a tension between sustainable responsible investing at one side and return on the other side. But it was, was not convincing. So that built up until a, a uh, library of, uh, of uh, research. And I think that uh, 2018 or 2019, you can find it in the annual report of one of our clients, ABP, that uh, you see ABP here in the first uh, row, uh, that uh, was a kind of meta study, which proved that um, you don't need to uh, uh, give in or sacrifice, as the question uh, formulated it, or return, whilst uh, you invest sustainable on a sustainable, responsible way. What I show here is, is are the long-term returns somewhere between six, six and a half and 7% in the past 10, 20 years for the, for the different clients. So you see here our four clients, ABP, BPF Bau, which is the pension fund for the building construction sector, SPW, the pension fund for the housing sector, and PPF is our own staff pension fund. And obviously you see in long terms, 20 year returns, that it's, it's all, around uh, seven and a half to, to nearly 7%. But that's looking back, that's typically looking back. Um, currently, we are managing the expectations from our, for our clients and the participants that it will be extremely challenging to give, come up with the same uh, returns in the coming decade. Uh, typically, uh, because we are in an extremely low interest, interest. Uh, era, uh, there is a lot of money competing for the sound uh, investments. So uh, valuations are, are relatively high. And uh, we, we have been preparing our clients for lower returns than I just showed. Uh, having said that, that has in the core not, nothing to do with sustainable or responsible investing. Yeah. We tend to think that uh, we get more and more evidence, also academic evidence, that in, in some markets you see that a, a, a aspect of ESG like governance, good governance, might even in mid and long term deliver higher returns than when you don't uh, pay attention to, to good governance, for instance. So that, that is uh, the way we look upon it. Uh, we have a, just a, probably a quick answer for Lee just saying, yep. five-year duration seems the most interesting for return of investment. Could you elaborate a little bit on the five-year? Uh, Sorry, I, I missed just the first briefly. part. On the five, uh, yeah. she's interested on the five-year return, and that, that span, if you can elaborate a little bit. I don't know if you want me to show <laughs> this Well, slide. it's better to show the, the uh, returns yes. again. <clears throat> and maybe the question, uh, also um, draws attention to the differences uh, between yeah. the, uh, uh, the returns. Uh, let me make two remarks on that. Uh, number one, obviously, each and every uh, pension uh, fund and the board of the pension funds make decisions upon uh, uh, the asset allocation. So you might say, if you, you simplify it a bit, there is quite a, a difference between risk appetite uh, between the, the, the different pension funds. So some of the pension funds allocate more of their assets to high risk, high return uh, asset classes like uh, private equity, like hedge funds um, than, than others do. Um, and in this uh, slide, you see the 2019 figures um, so it's five years before that. And then you see we are after the uh, uh, Lehman crisis, the, the great financial crisis period. So uh, those uh, negative returns in, in those years, 2008, 2009, are in the 10 and 20 years, okay. not in the five years. One other sure. uh, aspect here is that there is a difference uh, uh, that is... Uh, uh, that comes from the level of, of hedging of interest and currency risk. Mm -hmm. So then a, a pension fund makes a decision 
all the levels they want to hedge the interest risk, as well as the currency risk. So that, that explains part of the differences uh, between the returns in the, the five-year uh, period. Right. I'll go on a couple of other questions here, and then we, yeah, sure. we will move on. Uh, we have a question uh, on, uh, sorry, I'm, I lost the question now, it moved suddenly, <laughs> uh, about um, how are asset managers paid and rewarded uh, if they include any of the metrics on, on ESG and their financial performance, or if it's just on financial. And I know there is a person in the audience that does research, and even Patrick also does some research on that. So. Um, you might show, because I, I'm going to address this later yes. on. Let's, so let's we can... Now, yes. can no, no, let's pick it up now, because I think it's an absolutely an important uh, question. And I also see that... Uh, one of the statements is that a sustainable strategy doesn't sacrifice necessarily the returns. I absolutely agree with that. That's what we try to show our clients. But what's important for us is that uh, not only from our investment beliefs, but also from target setting from our clients, so the Dutch pension funds, we have to, to seek uh, sustainable and responsible investing. I'll, later on, I will give you, or you might show the, the slide if you like, yeah. where you see the targets our clients give us. So we have quantitative targets set by our clients, which are heading for a, a far more sustainable and responsible investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the one I meant. Yes, absolutely. So here you see that our clients uh, give us uh, responsible investment targets. Again, you see, uh, you see here the three major clients, ABP, BPF, BAM, and SPW. Uh, and let's start with the second line where you see the uh, carbon footprint uh, reduction in uh, listed equity. So our target was to reduce the carbon footprint in our listed equity portfolio with 25% uh, by 2020. And we got that target in 2016. So we had five years to reduce the carbon footprint in listed equity portfolio in uh, with 25%. Uh, one other uh, interesting one, at least from my perspective, interesting one was from ABP, the third line, where you, they gave us as a target to build up a sustainable development goal, an SDI portfolio of uh, 58 billion euros by 2020, which was doubling, I think, the portfolio we had of 29 billion euros in five years' time. So uh, the point here is obviously that we are driven by our clients who give us uh, um, very concrete, quantitative targets on sustainable investing. And I, I find that actually very interesting, uh, you know, because now it's not anymore... Uh, or they, they want to make sure you're achieving certain targets that you're not greenwashing because since we are seeing a lot of hype around ESG integration, et cetera, yep. having this additional, okay, show me with these measurable metrics how you perform uh, I, I, and, and coming from the demand side from the market, I think it's quite interesting. So I think uh, a lot I'm of sorry, the... Sorry, yes. may I make one, one important addition is, of course, looking back at the poll you started with, and I, I love that one. <laughs> it's very important to, to acknowledge that our clients doesn't give, they don't give us any uh, room to, to, to decrease uh, return demand. So they demand sound returns and uh, a sustainable investment portfolio both. And that's what we are, are typically doing. Um, so we, we strongly believe that we can build sustainable and responsible investment portfolios uh, and keeping sound level of returns within the risk, uh, uh, risk framework. Right. So we know uh, that a lot of the investment decisions, and again, even the ones we made in the poll that you were mentioning are shaped uh, you know, by investment beliefs. So what are the key beliefs uh, related to sustainable and, and, and responsible finance that, that are worth mentioning? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for, for that one, because it's interesting to, to just uh, touch upon a few of the investment beliefs we have. Um, 
I think it's good to show, uh, if you have the, the slide for me, please. Yes. To show that we have a set of investment beliefs um, of in which we embed also uh, the belief that a uh, good governance and responsible investing um, policy, uh, that they are key. So if I add it all up, you might say that from, uh, let's say, let's start at, at the top. Um, obviously, our job is to maximize pension value. And we do that by uh, striving for the high net returns, obviously within the risk profile and targets set by clients. And next to that, we, we want to be a, le a leading long-term responsible investor. Having said that, from the nine investment beliefs, I like to pick three which are typically related with uh, sustainable and, uh, and responsible investing. Uh, I already mentioned at the bottom right, the good governance and responsible investing principle, which in our view is, is uh, and, and a view which we have for many years is key. Uh, next to that, uh, I think it's, it's good to, uh, to understand that we typically have as a pension money investor, we have a, a long horizon which offers additional opportunity for returns. I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. And with long-term, long horizon, we mean 15 years, 20 years, or even longer. And that gives us a, a uh, advantage uh, uh, if you look at other asset managers or commercial asset managers, which often have a, a, a shorter horizon. So we are able to invest in, in uh, toll roads. We are able to invest in windmill parks for, and, and, and we mostly have a buy and hold strategy. So we don't, uh, in, in let's give a uh, private equity portfolio as a, uh, an example. We don't need to sell off companies after five to seven years if we don't want to, uh, because again, we are, uh, at the end of the day, uh, interested in long-term cash flows, which we can provide to our clients so they can pay our pensions. And that, that is typically a different perspective than a lot of other uh, commercial asset managers have. So that gives us uh, quite some opportunities to have to be far more patient uh, than others, and, and uh, that, that adds value. Uh, one other one I like to mention is that we strongly believe in the first mover uh, uh, advantage. So if we were able to move into a new sector, a new geographical uh, area, or the new theme, uh, um, and because of our size and the size of our staff, we are able to do that often, uh, we find uh, uh, additional uh, advantages and, and additional returns. I think the interesting here is that it also influences the way we work as an asset manager, uh, where you might traditionally see us as a party who waits for a plan, business plan, look at a question about finance and say yes or no. We were for many years in some of our asset classes, we move quite near the development stage. So let me give you two examples. Um, uh, we invested in very early days in a chain of hotels, uh, started in the Netherlands, it's called Citizen M. Uh, and we already stepped in when the uh, ideas were on, on the, the drawing table. So the very early stage. The same goes for uh, real estate in uh, London. Uh, I would all uh, advise you to visit uh, Westfield shopping center. It's quite near the Olympic Stadium. It's an upmarket, uh, upmarket uh, shopping center. And we started uh, talking with the developer, even at the moment there were all buildings still uh, at the site. So you see that as an investor, we where we traditionally were in a more passive role, we, we seek an advantage uh, with, in, in being far more entrepreneurial and active than we used to be a decade uh, or decade and a half ago. I've so been contributing to yes. your cities and M returns whenever I go to Zurich or London, or <laughs> I, I always stop at, at, at cities and M. <laughs> there is a point in question here from Elko, going a little bit to governance of ABP. He's saying, since you mentioned governments being such an important issue, and he's asking, yeah. how do you manage the potential conflict of interest of having shareholders 
who have shareholders' interest, which are your only clients who hopefully pay little service at the same time. So how do you manage that? Well, the interesting thing is that <clears throat> maybe, maybe I should give a brief history because until 2008, our largest client and shareholder, ABP, and, and, and ourselves, we were just one organization. By Dutch law, all Dutch pension funds had to split off their um, uh, asset management activities. So at that moment in time, ABG Asset Management uh, started uh, and ABP uh, still is our largest shareholder. This BPF Bau is the second one. And they are not as much seeking shareholder value as well as a stable, uh, uh, successful asset manager. So they don't look at, at the returns the asset management organization uh, generates specifically. Sure, we, we are uh, uh, returning a sound to profit, but mostly our shareholders uh, uh, give the dividends paid out back to us for innovation. So that's a very interesting concept. Having said that, uh, that doesn't, uh, so that, that, that doesn't give very easy attention between shareholder, pension fund, and our role. When I zoom into uh, the G, the governance aspect, you can see that uh, typically what's going on is that we build up positions, but we seldom have such large position that we can dominate uh, shareholder meeting, for instance. So there are a few aspects there. Number one is that we seek uh, uh, contacts and we seek uh, joint forces with like-minded uh, investors like North American pension funds, uh, Asian uh, Australian pension funds, Scandinavian pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, endowment funds from US, for instance, and all those like-minded uh, investors, uh, they every now and then can make a difference. So yes, at one side we have to be humble in the sense that we we seldom have a majority by law, by Dutch law. By the way, a pension funds is not allowed to have a, a entrepreneurial, majority. so we never have a majority. But seeking uh, others to join us that does help. That's number one. Number two. Um, we often seek the, uh, the route of um, dialogue, and that implies that every quarter, half year, or at least year, we have a dialogue with the uh, uh, executive board or non-executive board uh, on the issues which are relevant for that company uh, especially. Um, Going further into now into your strategy you know, and, and, and the way you invest, do you integrate sustainable and respons responsible investing into all asset classes? Uh, because we know that some are easier than others in the field, I would say. What are the challenges and opportunities? And if you can give us some examples uh, of each type or of, of what you do now. Yeah, yeah, good question. The, the easy answer is yes, we try to. <laughs> That's good. <The> more... <laughs> Now we get into but, the... <laughs> yeah, but now the real the real answer is obviously if you look at our uh, uh, assets uh, mix, you see that uh, we uh, at the top level we divide it in, in three fixed income equities and alternative investments, and we have around 40 percent currently invested in fixed income, thirty five in equities, and around uh, 25, 26 in alternative investments and. If you compare that, by the way, with other uh, asset managers, you see that we have already built up quite a, a significant uh, portfolio in alternative investments. Having said that, um, if you look at the different uh, asset classes, for instance, treasuries or credits, you see that there, there are increasingly um, uh, issues of uh, green bonds. So if I look at Western Europe, you can see that I think the French government started, then the Belgium, Ireland already, the Dutch government nearly a year or yes, a year ago came up with green bonds. Green bonds typically uh, 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 related to sustainable projects. And I, I want to keep away from a discussion of greenwashing, etc. But that's a clean area where uh, uh, 
where you see that we have opportunities to fill in the targets and the sustainable beliefs for credits. If you look at um, quite a different one, um, real estate. Mm-hmm. Real estate, um, it is, uh, 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 I think, interesting to, to mention that we were one of the founders of a benchmark, a sustainability benchmark, GRASP, Global Real Estate Benchmark. And GRASP uh, typically uh, tries to, uh, and I think they are successful, to report on, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, decrease of use of water, the uh, decrease of use of energy in the different uh, real estate uh, objects, which can differ from from office building to uh, <coughs> to uh, 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 all kinds of uh, well shopping malls uh, as well, <coughs> and that that's a way. We benchmark the, the, the progress in investing in that, or, uh, that environment. We had two questions related to, to real estate, and I know you will talk a little bit later, but I, I, I'll, I'll use this moment since you mentioned it. Uh, Marco is actually asking, you invest in operative assets or also take construction risk, giving your long-term investment horizon? I think you already mentioned a little bit, but mm-hmm. he's asking specifically, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's good to mention that uh, it's not something we traditional did, but what I see is that is a development from from the past, uh, let's say, decade, decade and a half, that we, uh, again, we want to end up with, basically, we are only interested in stable, predictable, uh, and we do hope inflation-corrected cash flows. But to come there, we uh, start... Uh, uh, earlier than we used to in the development process. So yes, that's a long answer on the question. Yes, we do take development risk, but we don't uh, seek the development risk and the returns. We seek, at the end of the day, the, the, the cash flows. Just one quick question from Olufemi, and especially to, to know a little bit, because we talked in other webinars about the location of these investments, if they're in Europe or in emerging economies. And Olofem is asking specifically, will you consider real estate investment partnership in sub-Saharan Africa, focus on retirement homes, communities, growing middle income class? I will make it even more general than this specific interest, but do you do investments in real estate in emerging economies? No. Yeah, we will certainly do invest in emerging economies. uh, although I must say that we don't have a very explicit uh, uh, country uh, strategies, um, we obviously are based in Europe, so there we, we started out. I think already in the late 90s from last century, we were the largest real estate investor in the USA, and we still are one of the largest uh, real estate investors in the USA. So North America is an important uh, 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 market for us as well. Um, early 2000, 2003, we started in uh, Hong- in Asia. Uh, uh, Hong Kong office was open, started investing in uh, Australia, uh, China, uh, India, which is an uh, important, uh, important economy. Uh, but we have been, uh, uh, well, not, not that... Uh, intensive uh, looking at Africa. Uh, until now, we have found our opportunities elsewhere. It's not the, the case that Africa is a no-go area, at the contrary. I think in a decade, uh, it will be far more uh, explicit in our investment portfolio. Uh, and we have done some infrastructure and some commodity investments in Africa. Uh, but still, we have currently more than sufficient opportunities in uh, regions where we have um, local presence. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for us, an important uh, way to, to grow the portfolio that if we want to invest in, in real assets, we tend to say we want a local presence to understand the markets, to have the contacts with the relevant stakeholders, etc., uh, I you make this uh, and, and you made a comment a few times about the engagement even at the initial t- statements of the development and 
and and as I mentioned at the beginning in the strategies, we have these these different methodologies or strategies in sustainable investing of exclusion versus engagement. You know, how much do you get involved and, and get engaged? And with companies, actually, you kick out or you decide not to have in your portfolio, yeah. uh, especially because sometimes the, the construction sector or big infrastructure or real estate, you have, a, I would say, every also in any other sector too. But how do you make these decisions? What is the philosophy behind or which companies do you exclude or do you engage with? Yep. Well, I already tried to, to, to make a little bit the yeah. uh, 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 ESG or sustainability as a, a part of our uh, investment uh, decision making. So basically, we have uh, four angles in the, in the decision making, which are obviously return, risk, cost and sustainability. And also here you see an interesting development where I say I would say a decade ago, we're looking at exclusion, merely at exclusion. Uh, you see a development in our trade that we move towards inclusion. And we are, well, in the early stage of that journey, to be honest. So what we tried to develop was uh, a scheme you see here where we look at structured investment at a universe, investment universe, in terms of sustainable and responsible uh, leaders, laggards, and exclusion. So the easy part still is the exclusion list. <laughs> the answer is you don't invest. So that, that's pretty easy. And to be honest, I currently, I give some examples. I don't think we have a very long exclusion list in terms of uh, companies. Uh, some countries are on it, including North Korea, uh, as an example. Um, some uh, product categories like tobacco. Some of our clients don't want us to, to invest in tobacco or in certain type of weapons, uh, cluster bombs. So that, that's, that's all on the exclusion list. Uh, but what is more, far more challenging is to try to find the leaders and the laggard in terms of sustainable and responsible entrepreneurship. Uh, let's start with leaders. If you've selected the leaders, then you obviously make uh, your next step in, in the analysis, which is how do they uh, score on the risk return? Is, are they attractive? Then typically they are uh, getting the leader label for the portfolio and basically we invest in them. If they are leaders, but the risk return analysis gives uh, is it, as an outcome that they are unattractive, we typically say we don't invest in them. Um, I think the most challenging for us currently is to uh, work with the laggards. Uh, laggards in terms of sustainable and responsible entrepreneurship. The next step is obviously to look at the risk return analysis and the opportunities for engagement. If those two are attractive, um, then you might say they are promises. So that's a reason to follow them and you might even invest in them. If not, they are not, uh, we don't invest in them, but they are also not excluded. And to be honest, this model is, um, I think, pretty new. Uh, we're working with this for, for one and a half, maybe two years. So I, I don't want to, to, to tell here something that we already have uh, much experience, but this is what we're trying to do. Uh, so yes, we still have exclusions, but we try to, to move towards an inclusion list of uh, companies to invest in. Great, and I'm very interested on this laggard side, and, and I think we had some questions also on, on this idea of build but better after the COVID crisis and how we need to transform uh, business models and which companies do you engage. Uh, but having this type of, of restrictions of what you exclude, you engage, and the time and the cost of engaging with this, uh, with these companies are having this proactive type of uh, investment. Does it have consequences in your portfolio universe, or what are what are the cost of being uh, an engaged, sustainable investor? No? Yeah, you absolutely are right. It's, it's engagement uh, does bring cost with it, uh, and we have, uh, uh, as every company, we have limited resources. So, what you typically see in the last few years is a uh, in listed equities, as an example, far more uh, focused strategy. In Europe, we do that. We 
already started in China and we had taken it to North America as well. And there you see that um, we try to um, find those laggards. Typically, um, we need to have a feeling whether or not a clear engagements uh, can be defined. And if so, you'll see that a number of companies uh, we select uh, decrease. So we have a limited number of portfolio companies with a larger stake, and we invest more time in the, the selected uh, companies we, we have. So if you look at the inclusion policy in capital markets, typically the objective is to identify the leading companies uh, gear up awareness of ESG risk and achieve meaningful change. And then you can achieve meaningful change by uh, starting an engagement. So we carefully select and uh, engage uh, with uh, uh, the laggards. Um, and uh, again, it ends up with fewer names in the portfolio, more concentrated. But at the end, uh, one of the beliefs is that they will perform uh, better than if you don't start the engagement. Uh, to make one other point is uh, we don't engage uh, unlimited in terms of time. So I often see now that, that the engagement um, takes, let's say, three years. And if, you, if we don't see any progress or milestones are not met, that's the moment that we find the laggard is not 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 uh, at uh, uh, the good level, and we uh, put it on on the not so much at exclusion list, but we not uh, uh, want to invest in the, in that company anymore. So I think a three years period is more or less what you, what you might think. We are we have another provocative question from Elko. I think. Uh... He's mentioning that ABP is an universal investor on behalf of, of its beneficiaries. Uh, so as such, ABP has an important role in society. Now, can you please comment on the discussion, if any, on a new societal contract? No, what is uh, the role of, of maybe of ABP and, and as an asset manager, and especially we are talking about engaging and transformation, know, for example, of things like Black Lives Matter or Corona or climate change. And I know we're going to talk now about the SDGs and climate change. So I think this is a, a, how this impacts your fiduciary duty and how, how do you work on this proactive side on, on I would say, uh, of transformational side of society. Yeah. yeah. Well, for long, for long the, the easy answer would have been well, that's up to the board of the pension fund, but that's not anymore the case, obviously. So we are very much engaged with climate. Um, if I look at our uh, sustainable investment policy, it's very much geared towards the Paris agreements, the, the two degree scenario. Uh, so climate is, is key, is absolutely relevant theme within uh, our, uh, uh, our daily job. Um, and I can give you the example uh, for real estate, where we try to uh, work towards a, a, a reporting on, uh, and there uh, it also shows the, the grasp uh, benchmark, the real estate benchmark, where we try to, to get grip in, also in quantitative terms on how we uh, make progress towards uh, investment portfolio with real estate. Uh, assets uh, moving towards a, a sustainable read to the green metric uh, uh, position. Uh, and to be honest, there were too many certificates, so we took an own initiative where we uh, where I like to, to talk about in a minute. But here it's really important that, that climate is absolutely uh, key in, in uh, our, uh, our daily work. Some of the other things you mentioned, obviously, we have an opinion on that. Uh, Black Lives Matter is, is absolutely uh, of, of, of key importance. Having said that, um, we try to uh, find a framework in which we can work from, for instance, sustainable development goals from the Paris agreements towards uh, our investment portfolio. And that includes climate, but it also includes uh, 
the other uh, 60, uh, because I think in total is 70 SDGs. And there you find that, right, there you find that, that uh, a lot of things going on in society nowadays uh, have a relationship with uh, the sustainable development goals. So what we try to do is to, to give uh, societal development a place here in, in one or more of the sustainable development goals, translate that to sustainable development investments. And, and that's the way we think we can contribute to a, a more, uh, well, to, to make it interesting to a better world, if you, will, if you like. So, and I know you're creating a platform, you're trying to work more at a system levels, not only on your own as an asset manager. So if you can briefly, because time is flying when you're having fun and we're almost 11.50, so have five or six minutes to finish. But so if you can give some examples, tell us uh, what this platform is and, and share with us some of your investments, you no know, on SDG investments. Good. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll do it very briefly because this only uh, this is instrumental. This is technique. Uh, what we are, what we missed, uh, where we were looking for as an asset owner, uh, manager and an asset owner, dear asset owner, uh, was a a sound, more or less objective way to uh, measure and and report on on the progress we make towards the sustainable development goals. So if you do a sustainable development investment, or at least you think you do, you want to know after one, two, three, many years, whether or not you make any progress. And there were a lot of uh, initiatives, but we, we couldn't really find uh, the one we needed. So uh, we tried to, to uh, build a, a standard for sustainable, investment, uh, sustainable development investments that can help us, but not only ourselves, but also the companies, the regulators and other stakeholders in a uh, more or less objective discussion on whether or not we make progress. And if you show the next uh, slide, uh, uh, Vanina. Uh, uh, one, one further, please. Yes, uh, I would love to give you some, some very concrete examples. Uh, if you take uh, from the uh, sustainable development goals, goal number seven is clean energy. So you can make a relation between uh, a producer of windmills. In this case, in our case, we have uh, Visitas in our portfolio. Uh, you can make a concrete relation with uh, clean energy. The same goes for responsible consumption and production. For instance, uh, producer of bioplastic, especially bioplastic for models called Avantium, uh, that makes a very clear uh, the, the correlation, relation between uh, the sustainable development goal, the, our investment, and the progress we can make. The same goes for, and I think that's, that's a very interesting example from India, uh, where we talk about decent work and economic growth. Um, in India, we have invested in a hotel chain called Lemon Tree, where people work who, uh, well, in Dutch, we say people who have a distance to the labor market. So that implies people who don't have a proper education or have a handicap. And it's incredible, uh, interesting to see that those people work in, in the Lemon Tree hotels. And well, that was uh, something uh, we wanted to invest in. Still, we get sound returns there. And as for the last example, talking about zero hunger, typically we invest in, in uh, uh, bioscience companies uh, like Hansen in Denmark. Uh, but th those are just four examples of investments where you can clearly see a relationship with the sustainable development goals. And that's what we try to do build a platform together with our other asset owners, open for other asset owners and asset managers. And we hope to set a, a global standard with that. We have two quick questions uh, that I will put together. One from Christine and he's saying, BlackRock has just censured some utility companies uh, because of the way, and you talked about your focus on, on clean energy. 
and uh, anonymous uh, anonymous <laughs> waiting <laughs> and another person <laughs> that's very funny sorry uh, another person is asking also if you're especially on this exclusion side for example and they're mentioning a specific company but if you see companies that have controversial problems in their supply chain uh, would you be willing to exclude so since you mentioned you had a small exclusion list would you be willing do you believe in the exclusion part to push for change or you work more on the engagement side of the story yeah well, currently we are moving towards working more intensively uh, on the engagement part uh, but yes we did exclude uh, some companies for instance because of a uh, well, let's say a lousy relationship with the union, trade unions. We excluded Walmart US, the retail chain, food retail chain, because they had a very bad relationship with the, the trade unions. Uh, and here, here I have to note that uh, part of the boards of Dutch uh, pension funds are uh, uh, repre representatives of trade unions. So there is a, a different angle maybe, but Certainly, we are willing to uh, uh, to exclude, but we tend to increasingly seek the engagement route. Uh, when you talk about child labor, uh, sure, you can can imagine that we talk with uh, in terms of supply chain. You you might I'm not sure whether or not we invested in them, but you might uh, imagine we talk with Nike or with others. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, chocolate, uh, Nestle, I think is a very good example. Uh, really trying to uh, improve the supply chain uh, in that area. So uh, the answer is increasingly we seek engagement also for the responsibility from a producer for the supply chain. Yeah, I know we had a, a, in the discussion also your proxy voting and you have voted against in, in different issues. So you do have this proactive way of engagement. And to finish up, because again, now it is really 58 uh, and we have a question from, from Time Flies when you're having fun. So Derek is asking, and I think it's a little bit as a closing to what is your, not necessarily directly on the view on the EU Green Deal, but you can mention a little bit about the EU Green Deal, but what is the world post-crisis, post-COVID crisis? How do we build back better and align sustainable growth with sustainable investment and impact, you know? So how do you see the post-corona world and the role of sustainable institutional investors? Good. Well, I'll try to, to summarize it in two, two minutes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. Well, um, let me stay, let me start with staying quite near home in terms of, of companies. What we see, what I tend to see increasingly is that in the business planning and the strategies of companies, uh, sustainability is getting a, a more and more important role. So that, that's what I tend to see. Um, and and that, that fits obviously in, in our uh, investment strategies. Uh, and I might have a, a, a bit of positive uh, myopia, but, but that's what, what I see. I think to see as well. Number two, if you look at the uh, different regions, um, after post-corona, you might say that uh, the US, um, uh, they, I don't think they come out stronger. There will be tension between uh, the, the states and the federal government still. Um, so that's a, that, that's a challenging one, I think. Uh, Europe uh, and the Green Deal, um, until now, uh, Europe, the European Union, when I talk about the European Union, uh, the European Union has uh, built up a impressive track record in not being effective in decision making <laughs> and uh, compromises. So having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the implementation of the Green Deal. Uh, China, I think China might be strong, but not getting uh, the world leader position because they are not allowed to yet. There are too much negative points in terms of uh, reputation, uh, and not only reputation, by the way, uh, to make them a world leader. Uh, so post-corona, uh, partly we'll pick up uh, the, the old routines, but I'm pretty sure that sustainability and responsible entrepreneurship 
get more weight and become more important in many of the companies I, I see. Thank you so much, Gert. Thank you, everybody, for your amazing participation. I apologize to all of you that I couldn't. I tried to include as many questions as I could. And, and Gert was very generous to actually go even into the hard ones. Uh, so I think just to close up, uh, we are going to leave, and I think I add a little bit my, my impression here too, in a post-COVID world of engagement. You know, we are going to see a financial sector much more willing to collaborate with corporates, but at the same time, collaborate to speed up change and transformation of business models and to fund these transformations, but at the same time to push for real transformation. So i um, happy to be part and, and to create here at the LEA Center a way of convening corporates and investors and entrepreneurs and, and, and uh, NGOs that want to further this agenda and the SDG framework. And so thank you very much, Gert. Thank you very much, everybody. And I yes. hope I see you next week. We have another webinar uh, and then we will have twice a month. So we're doing bi-weekly. And, and thank you for a very lively and in interesting session. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks.